Thank you very much, Carol, for joining. Uh, the harvesting team from Reimagine Education, Ecoversities. And uh, we'll go with the first question and get to know you as well. What might be a threshold situation that you are facing in your life and work right now? In other words, I'm learning and time for new ideas to unfold. Uh, this is a great question. And thank you for the opportunity to share um, some of my experiences on this. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I think for me, at this stage of my development as a human being, uh, and uh, this stage in my career, the biggest threshold for me, or the thing that is prompting change for me, uh, maybe not change, but uh, what what I'm what is prompting me in thinking about reimagining education and and, and similarly, you know, research. Um, for me, the question is how to bring together all of these sort of disparate things that I have learned as a subject matter expert in various things, as a trained scientist and researcher but also someone who has a, a higher education. I have a degree in fine arts. And then the lived experiences, those things that I know, even though they're not you know, approved knowledge by some degree granting institution. Um, and also to bring together my values, those inherent things, the values that I have, just I was born with, the things that are priorities to me. And then these things that I call my earned values. That is the things that along the way I've come to appreciate and understand as being important as a living creature on this earth in community with other living creatures. So the question is, how do I combine all of these things so that I can make a coherent and cogent and impactful uh, contribution for a better future? How do I define my legacy and how can I create it? This is where I'm in a moment of great exploration. Um, it's almost as if I am looking back on my own life and saying, wow, there's, there's like some rich soil there, but um, I'm not really sure yet what, what wants to grow there. Um, so that's, that, that is my current situation. I'm unlearning what I'll call conventional academia. Um, I received my PhD at a uh, land grant university. Um, uh, I did postdoc at a land grant university uh, in the U S my PhD is from a, a public university though. And I'm unlearning the conventional academic container. So how does a conventional academic experience hold and shape not just learning, but teaching, and therefore also the content, what is transferred, if you will, from the educator to the learner, or also in the case of higher education, the container that shapes and informs the process by which you as an individual learner will go through the experience of learning and especially with regard to being self-directing. Um, at the level of PhD, we, I, I would hope <laughs> that we would expect and support people in being self-directed learners. Um, so I'm having to unlearn that very conventional public university container. Not so much from the standpoint of being a self-directed learner. I had a decent PhD experience what I'm unlearning or needing to unlearn is how that container uh, influences the educator and the researcher as an employee. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
someone in their career being an educator or a researcher. I've found my experiences in conventional public run university in the United States to be um, a fairly abusive situation. Um, and uh, one that is a mirror reflection of many of the problems that we see with inequality across the globe. Uh, so I'm very much at that threshold of wanting to relay my experiences in that microcosm of that container that I call, that I call conventional um, academia and explore those things that I experienced in that microcosm now that I'm outside of academia. How can I translate my experiences there into world of other containers? Mm. Um, yeah. Um, I guess also I'm facing my own trauma history and uh, learning how trauma is part of my story, but it does not define me. And part of that trauma does involve being a researcher within that conventional academic container, if you will. And coming to realize that there are many women, uh, people of color, indigenous people that have also been traumatized in their experiences in this container. Um, that the trauma is not um, superficial. Like some people might think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. No, it is. It is a big deal because we're talking about people uh, in relationships with other people. And we know that damage done in relationship to other, pe uh, other people must be healed in relationship with other people. So this idea of reimagining education for me and at this threshold point in my life is about how can we reimagine education as not just for learners, but that education systems or these containers where we hold learners and educators together, that these are nurturing safe places for educators. Thank you. We and researchers. <laughs> yeah. We saw the landscape of your journey. And now could you, um, I would invite you to um, briefly share one, two events or people that shaped your journey with reimagined education like picking specific some moments? This is, I, as I looked through the questions before the interview, th this is the one that I don't have an immediate answer for. Um, I can't point to anyone in particular um, for uh, informing where I am now and my thoughts with one exception. Um, I've never been fired or let go from a job in my life, except for once in my entire life. And this was last spring. Um, and it was completely unexpected. Uh, and it really forced me to take a hard look at myself and my, my operating system, if you will, <laughs> you know, my worldview, the, 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 the things that I take for granted or that I assumed about reality and how I, how I view life. Um, and that situation really forced me to take a look. And some things I needed to let go of. Other things I thought, no, this is, this is core. This is core to who I am, and um, we need to hang on to this. Um, we can rework it, uh, revise it. That's good. Um, but, you know, this can go, but this over here needs to stay. Um, what that experience uh, 
uh, got me to look at was um, my sense of self. My sense of self in relation to um, different ways of learning. More so, though, for me, it's not so much about pedagogy and different ways of learning, but different ways of educating. So there's teaching and there's learning, right? I know you know, you know this. This is area that you've explored. So for me, the experiences were about not me saying, oh, I need to, to learn more about learning and pedagogy. It was more like I need to learn more about leading and leadership. But not from that patriarchal top-down fashion, but how can I convey and it's a question that I haven't solved, but at least I have a, a question now. Mm. How can I convey subject matter, content, so to speak, when that is needed? And when and how can I act in leadership to help others on their path of inquiry? And how do I know the difference in any given situation? <laughs> You know, sometimes somebody just needs to know how to learn it. They just need to learn how to use a tool. We can set up a, 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 uh, an experience where they can explore and learn how to use that tool. That's fine. That's great. But sometimes we just need to show them how to use the tool so that they can get on with further inquiry. And so this to me is the, the question um, that this experience of being fired <laughs> led me to, to a period of self-reflection. How to know the difference. When to just show someone how to use a tool versus when to set up a situation where they can do inquiry and figure out how to, or whether or not even to use that tool on their own. I think there's value in both, both those approaches, but it's knowing when is appropriate to use those different approaches. And then um, again, getting back to the leadership, I think that's one of being an effective leader, knowing when to intervene, to direct things one way or the other, or, or, the other, um, or in combination um, with different pedagogies. So, sorry, I know that doesn't directly answer your question, um, but it's the answer I have at this point. That's perfect. Having more questions is perfect process. So what is emerging for you with Reimagine Education? Can you share something about the prototyping idea? Yeah, I, I think that what is, what I'm sensing um, as wanting to emerge uh, at least in me and the work that I'm interested in, but also uh, in learning and education is understanding the difference between education and training. Um, I think that many times folks use those two words interchangeably, education versus training. So at least in the United States, outside of liberal arts colleges, uh, university is often seen as uh, training for some career or some job path, even at the level of the PhD. And I think that I am of split minds on that. Um, I firmly believe in liberal arts education in the sense that Education is about preparing humans to be uh, fully engaged or as engaged as, as their potential will allow them uh, to, be, to be engaged with life and to be in relation to other humans and other life on the planet. Um, that said, I, I, I'm also a scientist in, in the very conventional sense, you know, testing hypotheses, gathering data, blah, 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 which, yes, has problems of uh, colonization and colonization of knowledge 
and the mining of knowledge um, or um, a certain elitism, you know, that there's gates there um, to, you know, that there is gatekeeping on that knowledge and even the processes of getting um, knowledge in, in, the, in scientific methodology. Um, so um, I, I'm of split minds um, on that. Um, so I'm trying to, uh, what I sense in reimagining education, uh, what, you want, what wants to emerge for me and what I think elsewhere across the globe is a more a more fine exploration, a deeper and more granular exploration of the differences between education in the liberal arts sense, inquiry, nurturing the, the impetus, you know, the, the nurturing in others the, the desire to inquire about things, empowering people to do inquiry um, and to know that that is separate from training as in this is how you do this, that, you know, but training also in, it, in and of itself is important. I mean, you have to have certain skills on a job or certain uh, subject matter knowledge on certain jobs. For example, nursing, you know, nurses need to know things about medications. People need, uh, nurses need to know about basic bodily processes and protocols for um, caring um, for patients. So I would hope if, if and when I need health care that the nurses that care for me are trained. This is a separate issue from education in my mind. They're both important. And yet, is there some value in nurses engaging in inquiry-based uh, methods to their training? It's a good question, perhaps. Um, it's not completely expedient in that case. It may take more time to go through a nurse's education, to go through an inquiry-based process. But we have to ask ourselves, well, what is gained? What would be gained if nurses were going through an inquiry-based process, for example? Um, I don't know what that looks like, but my sense is that this is kind of where we need to press on. Mm -hmm. And I also sense that in the quest for greater equality and decolonization of learning and knowledge that we not disparage training, that we not disparage transfer of knowledge um, because it is expedient. <laughs> if someone wants to become a nurse, for example, and the cost is on them to get their nurse's education, um, it would probably cost them less in time and, and money to, to be trained as a nurse. Um, but that nurse thus trained, my guess is a very, very different nurse who gets their education through inquiry-based processes. So I just want us to be mindful not to disparage one form over the other while we search for innovation and, and reimagining um, of education. So that, that's just my sense. And coming to this uh, point, how do we engage meaningfully with traditional wisdom for learning and education? <sighs> that is a really, really good question. And I, I, I uh, was starting to jot down a few things about that. Um, I think that um, one place that we might start is, is fear. I think that tr traditional scientists or researchers, for example, there is a certain fear that opening up processes 
of inquiry uh, to be more equal. Um, that more folks have access to the knowledge of how to do science, for example, that the locus of power will shift away <laughs> from those traditional institutions of power, conventional academia, right? Um, and I think like we see with issues of say, white supremacy, uh, there's fear. There's fear of losing, I don't wanna say control because that implies control of others, but there's fear of losing control as in having influence and um, power. Um, so I think if we are able to make the bridge to acknowledge fear and to engage with those that are in more traditional forms of education, and that that bridge is really an invitation of to, to engage in safety. They are safe. Their worldview is safe. Their worldview is not being challenged. It is their truth after all. Um, and the invitation therefore would be, how can we have multiple truths in education? The, by opening up access to knowledge about scientific method, for example, does not threaten those hallowed, hallowed halls of academia. It does not. So we have to address that fear. We have to offer a bridge of safety, a safe way to, to talk. Uh, and to, to um, yeah, provide a container of safety for those who might feel threatened and not be inclined to engage in dialogue. That's what I think. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>